Hello everyone, Charles Watts here. Welcome back to Inside Arsenal. It's a weekend. I hope wherever you're watching or listening to this around the world, you are having a very good start to a couple of days off. Champions League final tonight, of course. Shame there's no Arsenal in it. I'd love to have seen that at Wembley. What a special occasion that would be, but still should be a really good game anyway. Real Madrid versus Borussia Dortmund. You've got a fancy rail, haven't you, for that, especially the way they get it done in this competition. I don't think they've been great, to be fair, the whole way through this competition. I've said it before, I thought Leipzig could have easily beat them home and away in their game at the start of the, qualify, uh, the knockout rounds. I thought Bayern Munich were probably just about the better side out of the two of them in the semi-final as well, but Real do what they always do, and you would imagine they're probably going to get the job done a little bit later on at Wembley. Looking forward to sitting down and watching that one, but still plenty to talk about when it comes to Arsenal. Um, Benjamin Sesko, of course, has been development since the last time I recorded a video with John Cross at Mirror reporting that he has said yes to Arsenal. Uh, we'll talk about Victor Rossemen as well. Reports again linking him with a potential move to Arsenal. Those um, rumours stirring up again from Italy. Uh, got plenty of questions and comments from you guys as well to discuss. We'll start with Benjamin Sesco, shall we? Now, obviously, yesterday I put out that show that I do, the Arsenal sort of transfer talk show with Team News and Ticks. At the time of recording it, that was on Thursday afternoon. And we did say at the start of that, that we were pre-recording Friday's show. So if anything big happened between recording it and it going out on Friday, that's why we didn't discuss it. And of course, a little bit later on, Thursday evening, afternoon, John Cross reporting that Sesco has said yes and favours a move to Arsenal. So I haven't discussed that since that uh, since that happened. So I thought I'd give my thoughts on it today. You probably hear a bit of beeping going on in the, in the uh, background at the moment. And that is my cat trying to get in through the cat flap. <laughs> Having a bit of a nightmare by the sounds of it. Um, but yeah, Sesco. It's an interesting one, the story about him saying yes to Arsenal. Um, and it sort of backs up what we've been hearing, that Arsenal are absolutely in pole position. I sat down with Sam Dean at the Telegraph just a few weeks ago after he'd run a story saying that um, the rival clubs now understood that Arsenal were in pole position for Sesco and the clubs that had been talking to him. Yeah the word that they were getting that if he's going to go anywhere, it was going to be to Arsenal. Now, the kind of big thing that's been hanging over this whole development is or this whole potential transfer is the fact that Leipzig are very, very keen on him staying in Germany and are trying to get him to sign a new contract that is being that's being mulled over at the moment. Sesco's agents being very public in that, saying that looks, Leipzig are a very good option. And sometimes development at this age, at his stage of his career, he's only 21, I think he turned 21 today or yesterday, um, is more important than money sometimes. And so there is still a good chance that he could stay at Leipzig. So it, if John story and John's, you know, fantastic Arsenal reporter, been around a long, long time, gets a lots of stuff, a lots of things right. You know, that story, if he said yes to it, that suggests maybe he isn't going to sign this new contract. And Fabrizio Romano had reported a couple of weeks ago that he expected Sesco to make a decision on his future before the start of the Euros, which is two weeks today. So it's all beginning to line up that he could well be on his way. He's certainly right at the top of the tree when it comes to Arsenal potential targets. We know that. And he's a really interesting one. And we spoke about it briefly, myself and Team News and Ticks, the other day on our show in terms of what his arrival would mean for Arsenal. And I think it certainly means that I would say Kai Havertz will be starting the season as number nine if Sesco does come in. Um, I think it's a really smart move if Sesco signs at this stage given the way that Havertz is playing, how important he's become to the team and how good Arsenal have become with Havertz as a central figure. It lessens the pressure on Sesko to come in and immediately be the guy, if you see what I mean. You can bet him in for six months a season, even, and allow him to adjust to a new way of thinking, a new style of play. And you know how long it takes a lot of players to adjust to playing in a Mikel Arteta team. That's, you know, the, the, lots of players have spoken about that before. And I just think this lessens the pressure on a really young guy coming in. Like he's done really good things in Germany and, his, and Austria before that in his very young career. But he's still such an, you know, he's still really an experienced player. And when you come to a club like Arsenal, it's a completely different world. You know, the size and scale of it, all the pressures on it, just absolutely huge. And on a young kid, that could be really, really hard to adjust to when you come in as a big money signing. And I just think that this is a this would be a really smart piece of business if Arsenal do get it done. We'll talk about Victor Rossman in in a minute, but you know, as I've said before, the sort of message that I've been getting ahead of this summer transfer window from people I've spoken to around Arsenal is that 
it's unlikely that there's going to be a big sort of superstar type sign in, you know, of a triple figure transfer fee in terms of, you know, breaking the hundred million pound barrier like Arsenal did last season with Declan Rice. This season, that looks a lot more unlikely given the messages that I've heard, which when I speak about Osman, that why I have sort of reservations about what that, that one might well happen. Sesco is clearly a really talented player, but you wouldn't put him in that superstar bracket just yet. He's a potential signing, although he's shown he can do it in top level leagues. He is someone who is going to need, you know, it's a bit of a rough diamond. He's going to need a lot of work. He's going to need a lot of coaching, the sort of thing Mikel loves to do with players. So I do think it ticks an awful lot of boxes. I've been watching a lot, as you lot have been, I'm sure, a lot of compilations when it comes to Sesco and his movement and his finishing. Um, his aerial threat, his touch, he just looks very, very excited. But you never know until you come to the Premier League, until you have to do it at a top club by Arsenal and show you can sort of live in that bubble and situation and handle the pressures that comes with it. We'll have to wait and see. But if this does happen, I think it could be a really smart piece of business from Arsenal. I have to say I'm getting more and more excited about the potential Benjamin Sesco signing. Um than I thought I probably would be a few weeks ago. But let me know your thoughts on it. Really interested to uh, to hear them. I'm sure you, like me, have been doing a lot of research when it comes to Sesco and have been watching a lot of him. How do you think he's going to cope in this Arsenal team? How do you think his arrival might sort of work out in terms of what Arteta does with his team and how he sets it up? I think it's a, it's a, I think it's a really, really interesting one. I'm going to try and speak to someone soon for a show if if this starts to really gather pace in the next sort of week or so, two weeks or so, which I expect it probably will. I'm uh, going to find someone who certainly knows his knows Sesco far better than I am to get the sort of lowdown on him and try and do a show on it because I think it'll be a really interesting one to hear from a bit of a uh, a bit of an expert when it comes to him. But let me know your thoughts on it in the comments below. Okay, from one striker to the other, like I said, reports emerging from Italy again that Victor Rossman potentially wants a move to Arsenal this summer. Seems like Chelsea have walked away from potential negotiations from him. His players constantly being linked. I mean, all I can say on it with these reports is that I'm a bit sceptical about them just because of what I've been told in terms of what to potentially expect from Arsenal in this transfer window. As I suggested earlier on, the whole unlikely to sign a superstar, unlikely to spend absolutely, you know, Declan Rice type levels of money. You know, if you're going to be signing Osman, who you would probably put in that superstar bracket right now, the price that it would cost would be very, very high. And I'm just not sure Again, from what I've told, and I might be wrong, you know, it, absolutely things can happen. The market can change. We spoke about market possibilities um, in the show with team news and ticks and how that can suddenly change a club's thinking when they go into the transfer window. But certainly from the messages I've been getting, I just, I'd be a bit, I'm a bit wary about this one. I still think Sesco, a Sesco type signing is far more likely, especially when it comes to the striker than an Osman type sign. And I think if Arsenal do spend big money, this summer on one player, it's far more likely to be a midfielder, I would say, than the striker, than the number nine. But we'll we'll have to wait and see on that. But I know lots of you, lots of you like Victor Osman and want Victor Osman to sign for Arsenal. I see it in the comments all the time. I see it on my Twitter page in the comments and people messaging me on it. It would be a very popular signing with some. Um, but I just think the money involved might well mean that it's not one that Arsenal really sort of push on for. But we shall wait and see. The fact that Chelsea have walked away because of potential money makes me think, I mean, that it must be huge if Chelsea are thinking now we're going to go down a different route because we know what Chelsea are like when it comes to spending. Um, and that just makes me feel like I think it might be a little bit a step too far when it comes to Arsenal. But as always, let me know in the comments below your thoughts on Victor Osserman. Just wanted to flag this one up today if you haven't already seen it. It's now five years to the day since the awful, tragic passing of Jose Antonio Reyes. Arsenal put out a tweet earlier. Remember, him. there's a nice bit on the website as well, sort of on the life of Jose Antonio Reyes. And before I sort of moved on, I just wanted to touch on it because someone asked me, I did a show a couple in the last couple of days. I can't remember. It might have been the Team News and Tips ones again when someone was asking about exciting transfers. Um, no, it wasn't team losing. It was a it was a normal show that I did. I was asking about exciting transfers, and I didn't mention Jose. I hadn't thought of it, but this one I was absolutely gripped when he signed. Um, obviously, I was you know early twenties, and I'd just seen him watching on Sky Sports the La Liga show that they had on. They had the live game Sevilla versus Real Madrid back then from like two thousand and three, I think it was probably. 
and he it was Reyes was a kid, you know, teenage player, and he destroyed Real Madrid. And I remember sitting there at home with my parents watching the game, like, who on earth is this Jose Antonio Reyes? What a performance it was. He destroyed Real Madrid back then. And then within a couple of months, suddenly Arsenal were about to sign him and you know, we'd never really spent big money on a player and then bang out of nowhere, Arsenal suddenly spent the money to bring in Jose Antonio Reyes, who was a player I already absolutely adored because I'd, what, I'd just seen him do against Real Madrid. And it was so exciting to sign him. And then he came on, he scored those two goals in his first start, uh, first game at Highbury against Chelsea and just an unbelievable day at Highbury. And I, I just loved Reyes. He was always one of my favourite players, even though he didn't really go on and hit the heights potentially that we all thought he probably would. He still scored some brilliant goals, some really important goals as well. And I think was very, very underrated. He was excellent. The, he definitely went into his show a little bit, I think, after he got kicked left, right and centre in that game at Old Trafford at the end of the 49 game unbeaten run. Not surprisingly, because the treatment he got in that game was unbelievable. How on earth Man United didn't get any players sent off for what they did to him? And I think that did knock his confidence a little bit and he went into his shell, but still a mercurial player on his day. He scored some fantastic, fantastic goals. Went on to achieve great things as well back at Real, when he went to Real Madrid and then back at Sevilla. Um, just, you yeah, know, tragic what happened to him. Just such a sad loss. And so, yeah, five years to the day since we lost Jose Antonio Real, Arsenal invincible, of course. And um, yeah, just wanted to have my say on him before I moved on. Okay, moving on to some questions and comments. Then we've got here one from Aaron. He says he's talking about Jiro Hasso, obviously an Arsenal linked player, played for Ajax at the moment, the young defender. He says, I think he'll be a great signer if we can sign him this summer, but we also need to sign a striker, midfielder, winger and a backup goalie as well. Ajax would surely have to put a hefty price for their young star. Wouldn't it be a bit surplus if we signed Hatto before we signed any positions that are way more on top of the agenda? It's interesting that there's sort of belief that you, if you say going into a summer transfer window and you're trying to sign three or four positions, that you prioritise those positions in terms of the order you sign them. So you want a left back striker and midfielder, should you sign them in the order of the sort of priority positions? So right now we know Arsenal really need a central midfielder to sort of improve the starting eleven. definitely need a forward. So should you sign the forward first in the summer, sign the midfielder first in the summer, and then wait and see how much money you got left and try and maybe get your left back at the end of the summer. It's an interesting sort of decision. I'm not sure how clubs do it, to be fair. I've never really asked that question when I'm speaking to people who are involved in the transfer business in terms of do you prioritise the positions in order during the summer? Um, I don't I don't think it would be a bit surplus if they signed Hato first. If they really, really want Hato, then I think they'd go and try and sign him no matter what, because anything can happen in a summer window. If you leave it too late in a window and st don't sign one of your targets, and then another club sort of jumps in ahead of you in the queue and gets them, and you're left sort of kicking your heels a little bit. So um, I don't think it would be a bit surplus if they really do absolutely you know believe this is the summer to get Gerald Hatto I don't know if that's the case I know they like Gerald Hatto and I know they're being patient when it comes to him myself and team news and tick spoke about that on our show that went out yesterday but um but yeah in terms of your the actual question wouldn't it be a bit surplus I don't think so I think that that I, I think that if you want him you just go and get him you don't wait in the summer and, I'll still, and I wouldn't expect if they sign Hatto next week for example I don't think that would stop them going out and signing a striker in a month's time or a midfielder in a month's time if you uh, if you see what I mean here's one from Samuel now he said hi Charles seeing Arsenal producing a mini documentary on Mika Biriff's life on loan after his successful double winning time at Sturm Graz this is very similar to the one they made on Balogun last year do you reckon this serves as just another way for the fans to get excited about a player that might rejoin our team or does it act more as an advert to clubs to push up his value. It's an interesting, yeah, I, I, I saw it, I watched it, and I did think straight away, it's like, oh, this is exactly what they did with Balogun. I don't think it's either, to be fair, and this is just my opinion on it, I don't think it's a way just to get clubs excited because I still think by far and away the most likely option when it comes to Mika Birov this summer is that he goes just because of his contract situation, which again was very similar to Balogun. You know, I believe all last summer that Balogun would be sold. I was sure it was going to happen. It did, and, you know, the fact they made that documentary didn't make me think any, you know, that oh, they're doing this because they're going to bring him back and he's going to be a popular figure. So I just think it's a decent bit of content for him. And I think the one with Balogun probably worked. It did good numbers for them. And they thought, you know what, let's do it again this summer with with uh, Mika Birif. I think it's no more than that, to be honest. Um, I still think he'll go. I don't think it pushes up his value. I don't think any buying club's going to look at the fact Arsenal made a documentary about him and think, oh, we're going to add another million or two million to his price tag. I just think it's purely a decent bit of content. And the Balogun one last summer did well. And the guys in the media team thought, let's do another one with Kabir if this is a good opportunity to do it. Um, 
yeah, anyway, talk to Mika Vera if you know that's all happening at the moment. And I still I still think he's going to go, to be honest. Uh, here's one from MHE87. It says, Charles, do you think Ramsdale would be open to playing abroad? I can imagine, given the age and contract situation of their goalies, plus their respective financial situation, good for one, bad for the other. Bayern might be a good destination for a permanent transfer this summer or next summer. And Juventus might be a good destination for a one-year loan this summer. Yeah, look, I think Ramsdale would absolutely be up for for uh, playing abroad. I think he's that type of character. I think his preference would probably be to stay in the Premier League. You know, Emil Smith Rowe, for example, I know he's got options to potentially go abroad this summer, but his preference is if he leaves Arsenal would be to stay in the Premier League. I think Aaron Ramsdale would be exactly the same. You know, they're English, their family's all over here. It's the best league in the world, in my opinion, and in their opinion. And so obviously I think they'd rather stay. And I think they'd probably get more money as well. <laughs> yeah, staying in the Premier League at a lot of clubs. Um, but I think I think if there's no other option to them, I mean that'd be a really appealing move, wouldn't it? Going to going to a club like Bayern if you're Aaron Ramsdale, Harry Kane's there, Eric Dyer's there, Vincent Company's there now. You know, although he's not English, certainly you know knows England very well, can speak fluent English. Um, so I'm sure it would be a very very appealing option to him. I mean, Bayern appealing option for any player, aren't they? A huge club. So uh, yeah, I think he'd be open to playing abroad, but I still think his preference uh, when sort of push comes to shove would be to stay in England if he does leave Arsenal. Okay, here's one from uh, Samuel. Is this the same? Have I asked two Samuel? There you go, Samuel. I didn't even realise. Look, you got double question today. Um, says, hi, Charles. One more comment from me. Looks like Wanyeri and Obi Martin had successful under-17 tournaments so far. Unfortunately, England's run came to an end against Italy, but Wanyeri scored his size only goal in the match and converted it to a penalty shootout. Chido did the same for Denmark, helping to send them to the next round, but both have scored a few times each. Hopefully both have strong seasons ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Wanieri was brilliant. I watched the England game. How on earth England went out in that game to Italy in the quarterfinals? Went out on penalties, obviously, but that second half, I mean, they should have scored four or five goals. It was just, as soon as that went to penalties, you knew that Italy were winning it. Because of the way the game had gone, the chances England had missed, the saves the Italian goalkeeper had made, you knew he was going to be confident going into the shootout. And it just it felt inevitable that Italy were going to win that shootout. And they did, and it was their goalkeeper who made the one save out of the at the 10 penalties. But yeah, Wanieri, what a goal from Wanieri in that game. Brilliant, brilliant finish. He had a fantastic tournament. I loved his penalty in a shootout as well. He saw everyone else was sort of going low. All of them really were going low. And he stepped up so confident, smashed it in the top corner. Never any doubt. You know, really, really confident. You could see that in his mannerisms and the way he approached that penalty. And just the whole tournament, he's been fantastic. And, um, you know, I've said it many times. I do think that if, if one of the two goes this summer in terms of Smith Rowe or Fabio Vieira, I don't really think you... I'm not sure you you replace him with a, another player in that squad, as in from bringing someone in from the outside. I just think you, this is the time to promote Wanieri, give him those minutes. They're not massive minutes. I think Smith Rowe played about 300 minutes this season. All in, Vieira probably about the same. So it's not huge minutes at all. But, you know, for those sort of players, it's frustrating and they want to play more. But if you're giving those sort of minutes to a 17-year-old, it's fantastic for him in the season. He couldn't really ask for much more than that. And it gives him opportunities to really sort of lay down a marker to get more minutes, if you see what I mean. So everything I'm seeing from Wanieri at the moment, I just feel this is the summer really to promote him, to give him a little bit more of a chance, to dip him into the first team a little bit more next season and to take on the minutes of one of the players who could potentially go this summer. Right, that's it from me, everyone. Thank you very much for watching. Appreciate your time. As always, thanks for the questions. As always, as well, you want to be included in tomorrow's show. You know what to do. Get into the comments, fire your questions, your opinions, anything you want me to talk about, and I'll bring some of them together and get them included in tomorrow's show. Until then, people, have a very good Saturday. Enjoy the Champions League final tonight. I'll be back to do it all over again tomorrow. Bye-bye.